everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. I want to be the greatest. Everybody on their face shit. I look around, I feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient. Hoping one day I blow up from the basement. Statement, the top is so vacant. I don't need shit that I think is amazing. Waiting for my day when I'm playing. Sold out shows for a thousand faces. Hey, give me that crown. Getting my way in to be put down. It ain't replaced all this my sound. If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now. I'm losing it. The noose it fits. I'm losing shit. A stupid myth. You choose to live or choose to dip. You choose to fight or lose your grip and lose your gift. Oh. I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Welcome back to the GSMC Chip Shot Football Podcast. If you experience some connection issues, I apologize for that. Uh, I did have some problems with my connection, but hopefully I figured that out now. Hopefully you guys are seeing it a bit better, Um, not as choppy, but it looks good on my end, so I'm going to continue on with the show. The second half of the show, starting with Micah Parsons, the rumors around him, and what's been going on with the Cowboys, as if I don't cover them a lot already, just always producing something to talk about the Cowboys are. Um... A few days ago, Sean Sharif of 105.3 The Fan shared a rumor that has been coming up a lot with the Cowboys and Micah Parsons. Again, if you aren't aware of this radio station, 105.3 The Fan, like this is the Cowboys' flagship uh, radio station, and this is where Jerry Jones appears on regularly. This is where um, the station... He appears on the station a lot per week during the season reporting some of this stuff and, or actually, apologies, right now I'm trying to fix the video right now. I'm told it doesn't look right right now, so just give me a few seconds, I'll be right back trying to fix this this issue. I'll be right back. Back here on the show, hopefully it works itself out. I am still recording, so this will be put out on YouTube if you see the segment. But I will continue with the Dallas Cowboys topic I was mentioning. The rumors around Michael Parsons that have swirled up after this interview that happened with Sean Sharif, in which he said... um, I'm talking about at least four different people who have told me that Micah has worn thin there. I don't know how much is true and how much it actually hurts. I don't know whether this is behavior of a typical superstar. I don't know how demanding it is, but all I know is this. I've heard from way too many people that if Micah Parsons was out there, there would be a decent amount of people inside the Ford Center at the Star in Frisco smiling or breathing a sigh of relief. Not really the kind of 
uh, reception you get with one of your star players, one of your more impactful players, and really, you could make a good argument the face of that franchise and how they are portrayed and how people look at them in the organization, how much he impacts winning, and I know Micah's known for speaking out with his his own podcast that he has in the media. He's been critical with analysts who have talked about him. The Cowboys are everywhere in the news, so you have ESPN, Fox, all the networks talking about them constantly, especially when the regular season starts. Um, they already talk about him a lot in the off season. Once the regular season starts and something goes bad, bad call, bad game plan, anything, they're on the Cowboys. So he's been known to calling them out, talking about it, reacting to some of the things that are said to them on TV. Everyone seeing that is giving him the narrative of all these actions as a distraction. Really this offseason, I've seen it a lot more on ESPN, mostly that when people see these sort of things, they see Micah talk on his podcast and react to some of these things. They see it as a distraction that he should stop. He shouldn't um, speak. They haven't said it, but almost in a way of them saying he shouldn't um, talk too much, really shouldn't react and say how he feels that much. And the biggest takeaway I have with people reacting to this, painting it in a negative way, I do see it in some way when maybe if he's trying to compare players to his own players, say someone's getting on Dak Prescott and he reacts to that, He can't go on his podcast and say, oh, well, he's playing better than this guy because so, so, and so. Comparing them and saying one player is better than another, that's not your job. That's an analyst's job. That's for analysts on TV, TV personalities to debate that, discuss that. I see where that can be a negative thing for the Cowboys and what they're trying to do. But when he's going out, you saw it when they lost to the Packers, going out and saying that that performance was embarrassing um, he wants to see new people in the locker room, people that want to win, people that are committed to getting better and getting over this hump that they've been stuck on for the longest time. It, going on and saying stuff like that, being critical to some extent of the decisions that coaching makes and stuff like that, I have no problem with any of that. And if Micah and that irks people the wrong way, rubs people the wrong way in the Cowboys organization... The bigger thing that I think we should be talking about is that having that being the problem really with the Cowboys is they have a problem within their organization of someone calling the team out, calling the coaches out, holding them accountable for performances like the Packers and even before then against the Niners and so on and so on. If they have a problem with someone really being brutally honest about that, that's the problem to me, not Mike going on and being really one of the only players that I've seen really go at his own team, trying to force a change, being frustrated, showing that he's frustrated, trying to change this whole narrative around the Cowboys because it really looks like it bothers him. He really looks that he is annoyed by it. Dak too, to some extent, but I think Dak and Micah, different levels, right? Micah is considered one of the best quarterbacks. Dak is as, or best pass rushers with Micah. Dak is considered a really good quarterback, but he just almost shrinks at times in the playoffs. You could say the same for Micah Parsons, but I think Micah has shown more star potential, more game impact potential recently, more than Dak. So Micah coming out and really trying to be that leader showing face, showing up in front of all the critics and answering back, defending his team, talking out, speaking out on his own team's performances, I don't think that's a bad thing. And if people in the organization think that's a bad thing, that's really the problem with the Cowboys. If they're bothered by someone calling them out, that ha- that has to be the thing that changed. Holding themselves accountable is one of the reasons why I think they haven't been so successful Not that they just brush it off and they act like they don't care. They are annoyed. But no one's going out and talking about it like as much as Micah Parsons. And I'm a fan of that. I like seeing it. This has been painted in a way that it seems to 
radical, too crazy to even think that anybody in the organization might think this is true or might have this sort of feeling. But again, this is one of the flagship radio stations. Jerry Jones appears on this station twice per week. So, you know, if it's coming from them, if they're kind of talking about it, discussing it, you have to take it a little bit like it's reality, reality, like it could be a real possibility. And that's how I'm taking it. I don't want to believe it's true. I really don't want to believe it's true because then it creates a, another problem that just takes away from football, which is what the Cowboys just have to focus on. But the biggest thing that I'm thinking, just reacting to this, is that this should not be the problem with a player calling out his own team, being critical of it. If some players have to go, that's evident. People have said it. Now Micah's saying that some people just have to go, that you have to get new people in there. That is not a problem to me. Micah is trying to change something about it. Could he do it a different way? Maybe, but I don't see a way where he doesn't show this frustration after so many years of being right there and then just falling short. He's showing that. I think that it should be taken in a bit different light. It's hard for people to see that, but I think with Mike on doing this, I don't have a problem with it. I think he shouldn't do it more. Maybe not do it as much in the off season where people just have nothing to talk about and they'll pull pick apart whatever you say, but I'm a fan of Micah holding this team accountable. There needs to be more of that and having this player on their team hopefully can create a change for them. Hopefully we can see a different type of Cowboys attitude out there on the field trying to not only win in the regular season because they're good enough to just get by, but getting into the playoffs, having a different mentality. He's even talked to Jerry Jones about it. Jerry Jones has said that they've had those conversations. That, to me, indicates a change, a proactive person that wants to see this team get better, trying to do something about it. Hopefully he continues on this way. And in all honesty, if you're going to choose between Micah and some of these people that don't want him in there, you'd be crazy to not pick Micah Parsons to stick around instead of these people reportedly that don't want him there, that rubs them the wrong way. They're just going to have to get used to it because most likely Micah's not going anywhere with the Dallas Cowboys. He should be there a long time. Hopefully they see a change with Micah if he produces that sort of reaction. I think he will, but we're going to have to see with the Cowboys how they develop over the offseason. And in saying that, I will leave it there. A bit of a shorter segment just because I had those technical issues. Hopefully it's worked out now. Um, but yeah, in saying that, I'm going to go into another break, the last break of the show. And on the other side, I'm going to talk about Merrill Hodge being very critical of Drake May. Some harsh words that he said uh, recently in the media. I'm going to get to what he said and my breakdown and reaction, if I agree or not, with his comments on Drake May. So that's coming up in a few seconds. You're listening to the GSMC Chip Shot Football Podcast. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Chip Shot Football Podcast to talk, lastly, about Merrill Hodge and his comments on Drake May. But before I do that, I want to remind you guys one last time in this episode, if you have any questions or combinations link on your screen, gsmcpodcast.net, with any of those, using this link makes it easier for me to see your question pop up. I can read it on air. And that way, maybe get a different perspective on something, carry the conversation a different way. It's a lot more fun for me, and I think it makes it more engaging. It's a big help for the network as well. So if you use that link, gsmcpodcast.net, with any of your questions or comments, we greatly appreciate it if you guys are able to do that. 
Now, I can get back to the fourth segment, Merrill Hodge and what he said about Drake May. There's no question right now around how difficult it has been for the top three teams, top four teams, to decide between the the best quarterbacks in this draft, right? We've talked about it already a lot. Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy uh, rushing up his way up the draft boards and being in this conversation as well. Caleb Williams is also in there, but he is going number one. I don't think that's really a doubt in most people's minds. And now some people have... Drake May as a top two quarterback ahead of Daniels. Some people might have J.J. McCarthy as a top two quarterback. Some have him as their best quarterback. Um, I don't, but some people do. Some have him at number three. And now Chris Sims. Chris Sims had him at number three. And now Merrill Hodge has him way down below that. I have him as four, but Merrill Hodge is really rating him a lot lower than I've seen a good amount of people rate Drake May. Um, I've had my questions about it. That's obvious. I've mentioned them on here. I think Drake May is a quarterback that needs to sit a good amount of his first year before you really see the kind of quarterback that he is. A lot of people will um, talk down that option, but I don't see much wrong with it. People just want to see results right away. And by forcing the results, I think you get even worse production from a heavy investment that you're making by drafting a quarterback in the top four, top five. You want to get the best out of that no matter how long it takes. You don't want it to take four, five years, but if you can wait one year and then see where you're at, I think that's a lot better than potentially stunting the growth of this young product that you're trying to draft in the top um, part of the draft. And more on Merrill Hodge. While he was being interviewed on WCC Radio, Hodge said... Uh, Drake May is the kind of player that will get you fired. Especially if you draft him in the top five or top three, he's going to get you fired. Pretty uh, pretty harsh words to say. Um, that, that To me, that was crazy to say. Um, really, if I'm being honest, say someone's going to get fired for drafting Drake May, that's how bad of a selection it will be. You can think that, but just to say it out there so... Um, bluntly like that you're talking about the patriots the commanders that have been in those conversations i think i saw today even that the commanders are having two meetings with drake may this week or next week on uh, tuesday or wednesday if it's this week it already happened but it could be next week i'm almost certain it's act- next week actually but they're having two meetings with him so If you're having two meetings with him, you want to really get to know him and see if this guy could be your franchise quarterback. You're not taking that time if you don't truly believe that. So the talk around Drake May being up there in the draft is real for certain teams, but obviously Merrill Hodge doesn't share that opinion on him. He later on went to compare Drake May to Malik Willis, who was a popular name as well leading up into the draft at a Liberty University He had a very impressive pro day, making some wow throws. All the scouts were there, saw him work out like that. I I won't lie, I was a a believer in Malik Willis in that draft when the Steelers took Kenny Pickett ahead of him. I I probably would have been on the side of drafting Malik Willis. That just shows how my evaluation of this quarterback can sway pretty easily. But he compared him to Malik Willis, how impressive he was, how high and how quickly he jumped in the rankings of the quarterbacks in that draft. He was one of the top names in there. Um, But then obviously he ended up being drafted in the third round by the Titans, and now it hasn't worked out so much that he is probably their backup or third-ranked quarterback right now in their draft order, in their depth chart, actually, I should say. And to that, after he compared both of them, he said that... Uh, He compared both of them and he said that I watched every one of his games last year. His last game against North Carolina State was probably the most embarrassing display I've seen from a guy who is supposed to be an elite franchise quarterback. He's erratic. He's everywhere. Merrill Hodge is a former ESPN analyst and a former NFL player. He played fullback in the NFL. So there is some validity, some 
sense to what he's saying with some of these words, how harsh he is, how critical he is. I At least that's how I feel. Getting these comments from former players, people that have been in organizations and in these uh, locker rooms, in these situations, that holds more weight to me than someone who has never played, obviously, who is on TV talking about it. Almost like they've been there, but they just haven't really experienced it. At least Merrill Hodge has been there. So I can take what he says and think about it, analyze what he's looking at, how it really portrays to myself. And I do still have some questions. He mentioned that North uh, that North Carolina State game. In that game, Drake May, I will agree, didn't look great. He had less than a 60% completion percentage, two touchdowns, two interceptions, and 254 yards in a 39-20 to loss. They were down 33-7 to at one point, so... Again, it doesn't paint a good picture for Drake May if you're just looking at that one game. And in his comments, I think he mentioned last year. He watched every game last year of Drake May. It, it, it paints a different story than what happened the year before because Drake May, I think, started getting all this hype two years ago when North Carolina was very good, playing in a very tough um, conference than Liberty it does they're in the ACC, so comparing UNC and how his struggles happened in last year compared to what Liberty did and how Malik Willis looked at Liberty, different level of competition there. You can't really compare them that way, UNC and Liberty, just because they face two different levels of comp- competition first off, and then in the year previous to last year, Drake May really had one of his better years. He looked better because he had better players on his team. Then last year, most of them left, and he still, not to make an excuse for him, still had to go out there and play well, and he was supposed to carry this team in a way. And football, like most people know, isn't a sport where one guy can just dominate, put up 60 points like in an NBA game, and still win the game or still make it close. It's not like that at all in football. Um... People really thought and bought into the Willis hype, but when he but when he went where he should have, to Hodge's point, Drake May is going way too high, but I think Hodge probably knows that he's not outside the top 10. So that's really the only similarity I see. If he, just saying that both of them were projected to go too high, yes, that statement is true. To say that Drake May could go top 2, that statement, that fact is um, too high. Same with Malik Willis. He was projected to go in the first round. That's way too high for him. Seeing how he turned out right now, he's still early in his career, but seeing what you're, you've seen so far, that statement is accurate. But I think it's too harsh because you're going off of last year when he gained most of his notoriety the year prior to that when UNC was better, when they made it into um, championship games where he had better stats you can't evaluate Drake May on just last year like you can with all these other quarterbacks. He, he is more of a two-year gap kind of player. Similarly to J.J. McCarthy, um, because Michigan obviously didn't win the champion, the national championship two years ago. They, um, they fell short in some way. Now, this year, they were completely dominant, steamrolled everybody, had one loss on the year. So that is a different perspective to take with J.J., Drake May has a longer landscape that you have to look at and evaluate. You can't just go off of last year because it isn't an accurate picture of what he could be. I don't have him as a top two, top three quarterback like I mentioned at the start of this, but I think saying someone's going to get fired by drafting him, I don't see it as that way because if you look at the rosters, the Patriots have Jacoby Brissett there. I'm sure the Commanders can still go out and sign a veteran quarterback like Ryan Tannehill or someone like that to make this transition easier. I've said that before. If they draft Drake May, the Patriots, I would still start Jacoby Brissett, have him learn as much as he can. When the, when the ship is sinking and you have no other options but to start Drake May, all right, then you start him. But to come in and be the guy right away, I'm not sure he's there yet. He could prove me wrong, 
and Meryl Hadron, that it's a real possibility, but I don't see it that way just because I've seen as well, I've seen him play, I've caught some of his games. A lot of people just say that his mechanics are not all well there. Some of the fundamental things, that stuff can be learned and worked on and perfected in an NFL environment with high-level coaching. Drake May can get there if those are his faults. Starting him right away now and having it go bad would really hurt his confidence, I think. Similarly to Malik Willis, I don't think he was ready at all to jump in when Ryan Tannehill wasn't ready to be that starter anymore. Malik Willis jumped in with really little to any experience of what he was to expecting there. You saw him really learn as the games went on. In all those snaps that he received in the game, that was pretty much his practice, his run at things at in an NFL game. He definitely didn't get any practice with the ones during mini camp or training camp or the practices leading up to games. It was sudden. Ryan Tannehill is not starting. You're the guy now. Go in there and try and try to win us a game. Try and get us playing better than what Ryan Tannehill had. That's not realistic, and that's why you see situations like a Malik Willis. He is very talented, but it just didn't work out because of the situation. He was forced into it. You don't want that happening with Drake May, so that's why I feel that. Yeah, Drake May might not be up there with Jaden and Caleb in my estimation, but I don't have him as low, or I wouldn't criticize him as badly as Drake May, or as Merrill Hodge because he's still a work in progress. Some of these other guys are a more finished product, and you have to look at it that way and see why the Patriots, the Commanders, have some serious interest in him. That's not made up. They're looking at everybody. I really believe they're considering Drake May that high, but, you know, we're going to have to see where they end up drafting him. It could just end up being Caleb, Jaden, Drake, and then JJ, or JJ and Drake switch up. All this talk could just be, you know, hearsay, but that's where it stands right now. Merrill Hodge, not a fan of Drake May, Evidently, but he could prove everybody wrong. Hopefully he goes out there and plays great. You don't want to wish badly on anybody, but we're going to have to see how that pans out. The biggest thing for me, the situation that they fall, that's going to be the biggest determinant in how their careers play out. And in saying that, I will leave it there. Good spot to end on on today's episode. Again, I apologize if it was a bit stuttery problems with the connection i think it's just the room that i'm in so i will fix that and find a better spot um to do the show but like i mentioned this is the end of it i have run out of time i want to thank you guys for joining me on today's episode of the gsmc chip shot football podcast presented by the gsmc sports network please remember to like follow and subscribe to the show And make sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for more of the network's content. If you want to see more of me and the show and this show, check out the GSMC Sports Network channel and the GSMC Podcast Network channel on YouTube, where YouTube shorts are posted every day. The full recorded live episodes are also on there to re-watch if you want or catch up on if you missed it as well as individual segment videos. If you don't want to watch a whole episode, you can watch a certain segment. All of that is on both YouTube channels. Remember to always tune in every weekday, every every weekday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time for more NFL and football conversations with me, Manny Maradiege, as your host. Signing off for now, hoping to see you guys all back here again tomorrow. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet.